think uh, Gavin wants to ask a question. Yeah. Oh, thanks. James, I uh, really appreciated your talk, and I read your Intercept piece in October, and you referred just now and in that piece to an obscure but very important top secret document from the Justice Department. How did you deal with that, and what happened to it? Well, that was uh, the document they wanted back. Uh, that was, people can hear me, I guess. Uh, yeah. That was the uh, document they wanted back, and uh, the document I refused to give them back, and I, I still have the, uh, a copy. I gave it to The Intercept so they could actually put it on online and everybody could read it. But uh, back then was, uh, uh, back then was uh, the days of before the internet and so forth. And so what the problem was, I got a call. I was at, in Harvard Square where I was doing a lot of my research. And I got a, uh, uh, I, they didn't have cell phones in those days. I had a beeper and my beeper went off. And I got a, a message to make a phone call. It was from Washington. And it was from the Justice Department. And they said they want to talk to me about some document. And uh, that's when I started getting nervous. That's when I got an attorney from the ACLU and so forth. <laughs> And um, that's when they started going after me to get the document. And I refused to give it back. And they, uh, they kept threatening me with prosecution. So um, I still have the document. I, one of the things, though, I, and this is a, a lesson I guess people can learn to some degree, is that uh, at the time, uh, again, no internet. I only had one copy. I didn't have much money. Uh, uh, and 10 cents a page for. 300-page document was a fair amount of money for me in those days. So I only had one or two copies, and I was afraid they were going to actually raid my place and take it. Um, so I wanted to get a copy out of the country. And our mutual friend, uh, Linda Melvern, offered her assistance. Uh, she was with the London Sunday Times at the time. And I called her up, and I said, i got to get a document out of the country real fast. Uh, do you know any way? And she said, well, there's this uh, friend of mine that's flying over tonight. If you, uh, if you want, you can meet him on this dark corner uh, in Boston. And he doesn't want to know who you are, and he doesn't want to know what's in the package. But you just give it to him, and he'll take care of it. So I did, uh, you know, most of my work is not very clandestine, like you read in Woodward or Bernstein or whatever, in garages. But this was one of the few times it was. So I handed him this document, and he said, thanks, and goodbye. And then I got a code. Uh, Linda called me up with a code saying she'd gotten it, and it was hidden in a very secure place. So um, legally, what that meant was that if the government came after me with a temporary restraining order or an injunction, I could argue that uh, it's useless, it's mute because, or it's a moot because there's a copy beyond US jurisdiction. And if they did come after me, she could have published it in the London Sunday, Sunday Times. And she actually did write about it when my book Do came out. Do you know out. what happened to that document? Well, I, it's been sitting on my shelf for the last 32 years or whatever. Um, and I gave, like I said, I gave it to the Internet, uh, to the Intercept, and they put it online. But I still have that copy sitting there. Uh, and the one in Britain? Uh, I think it's probably still hidden there. I'll have to ask Linda about it when I, when I talk to her. I think she told me uh, she hid it under her mother's sink. So it may still be there. Would you like to look under your chair, James? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> it's here. <laughs> 32 years later. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> yeah. I, I read James's story. There it is. Top secret and I, everything. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's, that's, that's the copy that we've got out if he's been busted. Yes. Well, thank you. So, we do go back a long way. I really have the person who should be here, Linda Melbourne, who we have a lot to thank. I didn't mention her name in the, uh, in the article because I was afraid she was going to be uh, uh, arrested or something by GCHQ, who like to go in and destroy people's computers uh, lately. It spent, it spent 18 months, she told me this week after we read your piece, 18 months hidden in her mother's bath underneath in the casing in a house in Islington. <laughs> <laughs> and it, after we read your piece, we went looking in my dusty archives three days ago because we, I called Linda. I thought, I've got to have this document. I must be looking at the keeper of the, the flame. And there it is. That's terrific. Well done. Well, thank you. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you very much.
Then we now go to the last speaker of this session. And uh, we are searching for the counter narrative, even from these very elaborate and very important stories for us to know about Echelon and NSA. Coming from a country that's not America and not Britain, but Greece, having worked in India, we're very happy to have Maria Ginou here. She's part of Tactical Tech. It's an organization who for over a decade has been supporting people with tools, techniques, methods, uh, who they were there really from the early days. And uh, Maria, you're now a researcher there. And before you were with the Center for Internet and Society in Bangalore, which is a very important place there, where you were part of drafting the privacy legislation for India by organizing many multi-stakeholder roundtables. Um, so I'm very happy because, you know, when you were born, James' books were out. I mean, I already learned in college about Echelon in 1980. That I, I learned that Duncan was arrested. For me, it was like normal. Okay, okay. I was shocked that people get arrested for information, but we didn't understand that we had to do something about it. Yeah? And you were born much later, so please help us into the future. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm not sure how to follow after such amazing talks and such great speakers. Um, I'll do my best though. But before I do, uh, just a quick disclaimer that um, any views and opinions that I express through this talk are strictly mine and not any of my employers or previous employers. Um, so yeah, I'd like to draw your attention to um, surveillance in other parts of the world, um, particularly in the developing world and in India in particular. Um, as mentioned, I used to live and work in India, which is a really fascinating place, but it also has quite an interesting um, surveillance regime in a sense. Um, much more su surprised than what I thought it would be. Um, I think when I first moved to India, I thought that it would be interesting to look at surveillance in the country for, ma for many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is because it actually is the largest democracy in the world in terms of population, which means that if you do have surveillance systems there, that means that it actually does affect um, a, a lot of people. Um, as we can see through this graph from We Are Social, um, more than eight, eight, 800 uh, million people actually have mobile phones. More than 200 million people in uh, India um, have access to the internet. So when we're talking about surveillance in the country, we're actually talk it's actually something that can affect a huge amount of, of people in the country. Uh, the second reason why I thought it would be interesting to look at surveillance there is because, as you can see even from these stats, um, the majority of the population lives in rural areas and they live in really bad conditions. And often um, I feel like um, people, mar marginalized people, people in the periphery of society, are often kind of like the guinea pigs of surveillance in the sense that surveillance tends to affect the most and usually affects them first. Um, so for these reasons and many other reasons, I, I started to look at surveillance in the country. Um, law enforcement agencies all over the world um, over the last decades, um, as explained by Duncan and by um, James, um, they often argue that surveillance has been carried out to tackle crime and terrorism. This is also the case in India. India is no exception. Now, this is just a picture from, the, from one of the blasts um, in the 2008 Mumbai terrorist attacks. Um, India, unlike a lot of other countries in the West, actually does have a huge terrorism issue in the sense that there have been around 30 major terrorist attacks over the last 25 years alone. Um, according to reports, there are around 800 um, terror cells which are currently operational, uh, supposedly. And of course, there was the Mumbai 2008 terrorist attacks, which involved 12 uh, bombing and shooting attacks uh, over, which, over four days. And the reason why I'd like to draw your attention to this very briefly is because the Mumbai 2008 terrorist attacks uh, sort of serve as a similar <coughs> landmark to the 9-11 attacks, in my opinion. Uh, mostly in the sense that following these attacks, um, India, the Indian government really started implementing a whole wide range of uh, mass surveillance systems. <coughs> uh, for starters, um, India has the lawful interceptor monitoring systems. Now, uh, mobile operators in India are required to install these uh, lawful intercept and monitoring systems at their premises and to intercept communications upon request from authorities. Um, in most cases, we're assuming that this has to do with targeted surveillance, um, since it's based on requests. However, the Indian government has also deployed its own uh, lawful intercept and monitoring systems at the international gateways of ISPs. And this essentially means that they can have indiscriminate access to most internet communications in the country. Uh, largely without court oversight, which raises a lot of questions. Now, the legality of these systems, again, um, well, according to the Indian, gov Indian government, this is regulated under Section 5, Paragraph 2 of the Indian Telegraph Act. 
Um, however, this is a really old law. It's from 1885, for starters. Second of all, um, this law states that um, the government of India can intercept communications for um, public safety in the occurrence of um, a public emergency when it is necessary, expedient to do so. As you can understand, uh, these terms are quite broad and vague and can potentially allow for, for breach. Uh, the network traffic analysis system is actually quite new, or at least it's new to me in the sense that we only just found about it last year. Um, I have no idea how long this has been operating because unfortunately a lot of the systems in India are carried out widely in secret and that's kind of a trend that they might be actually copying from the West, I think, in a way. So the, Netra, the, Net, the Netra is a mass surveillance system. Essentially what it does is that it intercepts and monitors um, almost all internet communications. It searches for suspicious keywords and suspicious key phrases. And a lot of this monitoring involves social media, blogs, tweets, instant messages, uh, even uh, voice over IP, uh, looking for uh, like du so-called dubious voice traffic. Uh, what's interesting is that um, Two years ago, in November, uh, two women in Mumbai were arrested um, following their posts on Facebook, which criticized the shutdown of the city following the death of a politician. And a lot of arrests have occurred over the last months as well. In fact, um, just a few months before um, the new Prime Minister, Modi, um, assumed office, uh, around 20 individuals were arrested uh, based on their posts on Facebook, Twitter, um, WhatsApp, which criticized uh, the new Prime Minister. Um, so. It's not really clear if these arrests were um, aided by the system, but I think that might be a possibility. Anyhow, these types of arrests do raise a whole bunch of serious questions, not only for privacy, but also with regards to freedom of expression. Um, and again, with regards to the legality of the system, um, authorities will argue that this is legally backed by the aforementioned law that I mentioned before, Section 5 of the Indian Telegraph Act. Again, um, quite controversial, it's very broad. And also that it's uh, supposedly regulated under Section 69 of the Information Technology Act, which requires the interception of all information transmitted through a computer resource, which again allows potentially for um, huge privacy violations and so forth. And it's also quite uh, noteworthy, I think, that under the same law, um, uh, if authorities ask you in India to disclose your, your private encryption keys, uh, you have to do so. And if you don't comply, that you can be in prison for up to seven years. Um, this is the case I mentioned before of the woman who were um, arrested in Mumbai. Um, so, yes, there are, there are various uh, surveillance systems. Now, India um, really likes to centralize its systems in a way. Um, it has a trend of developing a lot of centralized databases uh, for all the surveillance over the last years. The central monitoring system is something that we only found about last year, in particular in April 2013. However, um, some documents that were leaked to us um, basically showed that this was initially envisioned um, in 2009 following the Mumbai terrorist attacks and that it was actually approved by the Cabinet Committee on Security back in 2011. Um, now, what the Indian government argues is that this system will only automate the existing process of interception and monitoring. Um, and practically, what this means is... So I've created this graph here. So telecom service providers in India, um, prior to the central monitoring system, had lawful intercept and monitoring systems installed at the premises, as mentioned before. Now with the central monitoring system, uh, these uh, lawful interception and monitoring systems are integrated with intercept, store and forward servers, which are then connected to various regional monitoring centers, which are um, all over the country. And then all these regional monitoring centers are basically connected to the central monitoring system. This means that when um, tele telecom service providers intercept communications uh, based on uh, requests from authorities uh, in, in, any, in any way, uh, all information, all intercept communi communications are transmitted to the central monitoring system, which, is, uh, which has been built and which is currently right now in Delhi. What this, the reason why this is important to look at is because essentially this means that the CMS authority, the intelligence agencies, the nine intelligence agencies which can have access to this data, um, can, can basically bypass TSPs. By having direct access to the central monitoring system, they can have direct access to it without having to provide a warrant or anything of the sort which they had to do previously. And this again raises a whole bunch of questions with regards to legality, abuse, breach, accountability, and so forth. Um, so, in order to understand um, surveillance in India, I started looking at some, uh, I tried to see what kind of companies exist in the country which provide the gear in order to make these systems possible. And so I looked at um, 
a look at a whole bunch of companies which seem to provide solutions which would be useful in this case. Narrow down to a sample of 50 companies, and these are the 50 companies that I looked at. Um, and they, they sell a whole wide range of technologies, ranging from internet monitoring solutions, biometrics, um, drones, you name it, pretty much everything. Um, from these companies, because um, I don't have too much time to go, to go into much uh, depth, uh, I'd just like to draw attention to uh, three. One of them is Comlabs, and actually um, a lot of their brochures have been leaked by WikiLeaks, so you can go to the spy files and you can read more details there as well. Uh, but what's interesting is, for example, they one of their solutions is called VerbaCenter, and what it does is that um, it looks out for uh, cognitive and emotional stress in voice calls and flags them. Then other companies, like Comtrail, for example, um, sell uh, off, off their interception solutions, um, mass monitoring solutions, uh, mass monitoring of IP and voice networks. And then there's uh, this other company, which I'm personally uh, rather interested in, it's called Palladia Networks, and it's actually also based in Bangalore, where it used to be. And they sell a whole wide range of solutions, including internet monitoring solutions, um, SSL decryption and deception solutions, as well as cyber cafe monitoring solutions and a whole bunch of other creepy solutions. <laughs> What's interesting, though, is that um, in one of the interviews with Mr. Mohanty, who's the CEO of Player Networks, he actually states that um, his customers include uh, telecom service providers in Saudi Arabia, um, in Qatar, and in the United Arab Emirates. Well, it's not clear if he, if he sells to TSPs in those countries, those Arab countries, um, as a sell interception and decryption systems per se. I think it is a possibility. Don't go too fast, because not everyone is going to Sorry. <laughs> you have time to oh, OK, great. Um, well, it's not clear if, um, if Palladia Networks actually does sell these um, interception systems to telecom service providers in these countries. Um, there, there are customers, and I think that is a big probability. Um, another centralized system is uh, the National Intelligence Grid, NACRID, uh, which essentially what it does is that it links the databases of the various departments and ministries of the government of India in order to create intelligence, basically. So 11 security agencies in India have access to 21 um, citizen databases, uh, which can include data like, your, your, like people's um, bank account details, their passport data, uh, registration data, a whole bunch of data which you, know, you regularly have in various departments, ministries of the government. Well, I think it's interesting that they're decentralizing this is because it's completely different to have data in different databases. But once you link the database together, all this data can tell a story about individuals. And the larger the, the, the population is, often larger the, the, the probability for error is as well. So when you're talking about profiling um, and creating patterns of intelligence and so forth on data of literally a billion people, I think the, the, the probability of error is extremely high. And the, the main problem is that, again, there's no real um, regulations behind this. There's no real um, mechanisms for checks and balances to see if breaches can occur. Now, I'd really like to draw your attention to the UID, which is literally the world's largest biometric data collection scheme. Now, this uh, scheme started back in 2009, um, like everything else, following the Mumbai terrorist attacks. Um, essentially, it's supposedly voluntary, although the, whether it's voluntary or not is a huge debate, um, because um, there's a lot, because through the UID, um, so Indians can gain access to a whole bunch of government services, and if they aren't registered with the UID, then they can't get access to them. So it's not really clear if it's voluntary or not. Anyhow, um, through the UID, Indians are required to um, provide their biometrics um, and, and their iris, uh, their, their iris and their fingerprints, and also demographic data. And then all this data, both biometrics and demographic data, um, creates a 12-digit number for them, which is called ADAR. Now, um, there's a huge debate in India whether this uh, violates privacy or not. Well, a lot, many argue that it does violate uh, individuals' right to privacy. But um, many, many in India argue that um, you know, the trade-off is worth it because it, it provides Indians an identity, it provides them better access to government services, it will improve their quality of life, and so forth. And so this is a massive debate. However, I personally find it extremely concerning for multiple reasons. Uh, first of all, um, technology is not infallible. Biometrics are not infallible. It's extremely easy to spoof fingerprints, for example. Um, it's extremely easy to, um, there's not, not one specific type of biometric device which is used in all cases. Every uh, enrollment center in India has different types of devices, different types of technology, and errors can occur, which means that um, this can have an impact on, on, your, on yourself. Because, for example, if the wrong biometrics are linked to your identity, then how do you know that, um, 
how can you control that, for example, an extreme scenario that the biometrics of a criminal or, or whoever <laughs> will be linked to you personally that have repercussions on your personal life? The, the answer is you can't control that, and that itself is an issue. The second thing is that um, India's country, which is quite famous for its high levels of corruption, um, in many cases, um, um, a lot of things are unorganized. Like they, they found like applications for the UID just lost on the streets, literally. Um, there was this uh, TV channel Sting operation a few years ago where they uncovered that uh, the Mysore uh, enrollment center had issued fake UID cards. Um, and so it, it's not really um, reliable to, to depend on a system like this in order to be identified. But I think what's even more concerning out of all of these is basically, that, is basically the contractors. Um, so in order for the scheme to be carried out, uh, the UID Authority uh, collaborates with a whole bunch of um, companies. One of these companies is Comet, uh, Comet uh, Technologies, which, which uh, about uh, two years ago, one year ago, I don't remember exactly when, um, was, was given literally millions of rupees uh, to install biometric devices in, in the state of Karnataka. However, this company didn't go, didn't go ahead with that and just left the contract. So they didn't deliver the service, they took the money and they left. And they've made various cases like that with these companies. But another company, which is uh, L1 Identity Solutions, um, have strong ties with US intelligence agencies like the CIA. One of the board members used to work with the CIA. And so this raises a whole bunch of serious questions as to whether um, by having contractors with these type of ties, providing the, the devices and the gear um, and the infrastructure for the system, whether this is compromising Indian national security. And so, in short, um, for, for various reasons, all these schemes are quite problematic. Um, overall, um, all these schemes that I just mentioned, which are just a few of them actually, are largely unregulated. The Indian government argues that they are regulated under specific sec sections of the specific laws, but these sections, like I mentioned before, are very broad and vague, and they do allow for breach, in my opinion. Um, uh, the, the other thing is that in India right now, there currently is no privacy legislation, which means that you have this massive democracy where they're building all these surveillance systems, and yet there is no law which can protect citizens. However, the good news is that both the, the governments of India and the civil society sector have taken initiatives in order to improve this. Um, as mentioned before, um, the Center for Internet, the Center for Internet Society in Bangalore, where I used to work, um, has drafted a privacy bill, uh, was drafted in 2013, um, and this was discussed through um, seven multi-stakeholder roundtable meetings through which uh, we invited um, people from um, the, the industry, banks, governments, civil society to discuss it and see how we go forward with it. What was interesting was that the industry actually has vested interest in passing privacy legislation, which on the one hand, which, which is a good thing because that means that they're exercising pressure to the Indian government. And one of the main reasons I think why they're interested in, why they have personal interest in privacy law is because uh, they really want India to acquire um, EU uh, data adequacy uh, so that they can expand their market in the European Union. Um, as a result of the industry's pressure, uh, the Department of Personnel and Training in India has drafted their own privacy bill. Of course, it's not perfect and it's not completely in compliance with uh, various privacy principles, but still, I think it's definitely a very good, uh, a, a, a decisive first step and it's still very promising. Um, also, there's a whole bunch of groups who are challenging the, the systems that I mentioned before. For example, the Say No to UID campaign um, is challenging the UID biometric system and they have done really amazing work and they've been They've been going to court, they've been challenging the UID scheme at the Supreme Court for many years now on, on, the, on the grounds that uh, of its contractors, of corruption, of, on, that violates the right to privacy and so forth. And then of course there's also another campaign which was created last year which is called um, um, Stop CMS, which is challenges again the central monitoring system. So there are, there are a lot of efforts and so forth, but still this is not enough. Because the main problem in India um, is that a lot of these systems are carried out in secret. There's no transparency whatsoever. The, the little information that I shared with you now, uh, and most of the information I acquired through my research, uh, was information that we literally had to dig out of people, information that might have been leaked to us. Um, and my point's been that in order for us to be able to increase transparency as to what's going on in the biggest democracy in terms of population country in the world, uh, we definitely need people to leak more documents. And there's a lot of platforms for that. And one of them, for example, is Global Leaks, an, an open source project to uh, leak documents. So um, it would be wonderful if we could like, increase transparency and try to deal with these issues because it's really gone out of hand, I think. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, uh, maybe we have uh, one or two follow-up questions, and then uh, we all go to lunch. I read a document uh, which was a leak from Stratfor uh, on an article written in, in a newspaper from Barcelona. And it described a surveillance machine within uh, Catalonia which was cooperating between different nations. So it described, for instance, that um, Indians would be monitored by Indian intelligence with the cooperation of Spain, and they would kind of coordinate uh, all of the all of the different uh, surveillance needs among different communities within Catalonia. And I wanted to know, or know if there's any information about actually a lot of these systems are in cooperation rather than in competition, which is which is an outlook uh, that, that we we assume that these nations are in competition. Yeah, let's, let's some more questions. We just get first get the questions, yeah, and then one round of answers. Thank you. Um, my name is Peter Bale, and I'd like to ask a, a sort of elephant in the room question, if possible, um, for, probably from James and Duncan, but picking up on something that Maria said as well. Is the is the issue here? I mean, when Truman set up the NSA, he presumably did it because he felt it would protect American citizenry at some point. Is the issue here really the one that Maria mentions about transparency, that this, all of this is being done in our own names, or is it the fact it's done at all? I'd just love to address that sort of slightly philosophical question, because the, the foundations of this were, were presumably with some good intent, not just a spectre of control. Any other questions? I guess I want to put out maybe a little challenge. I work in health information technology, and um, one of the problems we're having in healthcare in the United States, but also around the world, is that it's hard to get the right information about a patient to help them. Um, and it's not just health information, almost any part of your life could be related to healthcare. The more we push for protecting privacy in a very narrow way, the more we also make people vulnerable. And I think the current state of health information technology is horrible and scary. I think I want to just go back to what Cy Hurst said, which is um, these people are going to do a lot of damaging, horrible things no matter what. We should not put our lives at stake um, for this. We need to find some way to control this. I don't mean to belittle any of the things that people have been saying. They're very important. But I think we need to understand the value of data in, for people's livelihoods, for improving people's lives, especially in rural areas. Um, <clears throat> it's another important thing to be considered. <laughs> yes, tomorrow Karen Spike will speak about this in the session about methods of investigation. Okay, last two questions. I keep track, you kept track too. Thank you. Uh, my name's Ian Puddock. I blog and tweet uh, about police corruption and lack of police accountability. Uh, my question is, the, the police are in a unique position uh, away from the public because they swear an oath to uphold the law. Where are the police in this? Because a lot of government officials, bureaucrats, are there because of what they do, but they don't actually swear this unique oath. And I just wondered where the police were in holding these people to account when they break the law. I'm um, interested to get your views on government-sponsored um, industrial espionage in terms of the trade agreements in particular um, with the, both the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, and the TTIP. And my really question is that I would really like you also to address the whole privatisation of this uh, intelligence business, that it's all outsourced. That's e very scary, even more. OK, I guess we, uh, you can handle another... Five minutes before lunch? Yes? Good. No way? Well, no way leaves now, and we just take another five to ten. You have three minutes? Okay, and you go. Duncan, please. Um, Pick one and uh, address it. Uh, so I was trying to keep a note uh, and then just give a sort of integrated response. To the, the council, uh, a colleague from Catalonia, 
Um, I would say go and look at what's put out there by um, Big Brother Watch and Privacy International. There's a lot of stuff, and you, you'll be able to give more information on the private companies. There's a lot of companies emulating the kind of kit that NSA, GCHQ, and others have developed and putting it out there, and you can get information on that. And it sounds like that's what you were looking at. Uh, to the uh, colleagues talking about health, yes. Um, we're not going to get away from the fact that our, our lives run on data, and they're going to run on more data. So closing it down, not providing health care, or taking the Cy Hirsch solution to medical needs in the 21st century isn't going to be for your doctor. He's got to write it down. It's got to go on a computer. How do we deal with that is the issue. The policing question raises a more grave thing, which um, we can only hint at. Maybe some other people can pick it up later. But because these SIGINT people have created an empire of data, whether they're partly functional, I think James was suggesting, or wholly dysfunctional, as I was suggesting, they certainly have all of those elements. But they've created this stream, and they haven't got people fighting wars anymore to fund their budgets. So what they are, the transition they're in is not just trying to change laws around the world to build this intelligence multinational, which I suspect is what you just told us happened in India. Five years from now, you'll probably find that NSA's Foreign Affairs Division created these laws and caused them to come into place. So the drive is to take um, the secret surveillance, still protected by the intelligence and secrecy, and push it through the criminal justice system to bring prosecutions and people to trial. Now, Sai, I think, hinted at that. I think we all of us here on the panel know of examples of that. And that is the process they're trying to do. Indeed, one article in The Intercept that uh, a colleague uh, did, Ryan Gallagher, was about a, an intelligence community outreach pro program to push this data there. Now, this is the greatest travesty of our system simply because it defeats what justice is about. It makes it invisible, unaccountable. It undermines the constitution. That's an area you've got to watch. Uh, and to Peter, who asked probably a sort of overriding question, I incline to what I think, James, in your article you said, NSA is there for legitimate purposes. That's being recognized. Uh, there are goods uh, to be derived, but no accountability, no proper law, no transparency, uh, and you have a rogue system that does all kinds of things. They do not have the courage. They berate us, they raid us, they got us to smash our hard drives, they criticize us, but they do not have the courage to come out in open debate and actually achieve what uh, they say we should respect. Yes, there are limits to privacy, but there are limits to surveillance, and you can't have a debate when not only is there secrecy and no accountability, but they'll arrest you, jail you, punish you, prosecute you, hound you and your sources if you try to find out and report. That's the way, yeah. um, in response to a question up there um, with regards to transparency, um, of course it's not only about transparency. Um, on the one hand, transparency is, is very important in the sense that if you don't know what systems actually exist, if you don't know that you've actually been spied on, if you don't know how these systems work and who's in charge of them and all the other details that come with that, then how are you supposed to challenge that legally or in any other way? So in that sense, um, I emphasize that transparency is important. Uh, well, that's one of the reasons at least. But of course, it's, it's not only about transparency. I mean, surveillance itself, I think, is extremely concerning. Um, the, the idea that it's normal to be spied on, the idea that it's normal to have third parties monitoring our lives, collecting data about our lives, um, aggregating that and analyzing that on a daily basis without a knowledge or consent, that itself is terrifying. So of course, it's not only about transparency, but of course, in order to be able to tackle the main issue, I think transparency is one way to go. Um, the other question um, about um, agencies collaborating instead of competing. Um, yes, I definitely think it is mostly about, well, to some, degree, to some degree it might be about competing, to another degree it might be about collaborating. It depends on where their interests lie, I guess, and depends on whose allies with who and what type of intelligence they want to acquire. Um, with regards to India in particular, um, well, yes, they, they have a, 
if I'm not mistaken, I think they have a mutual legal systems treaty with Spain, which are kind of explained to some extent, and with a whole bunch of other 34 countries. Um, and th with these countries, of course, they can share intelligence data. And then, so in that sense, when, when, there, when there are allies in terms of intelligence gathering, uh, yes, there will be collaboration. And we have seen collaboration on, on multiple levels, even with the NSA, even like in the, in the, the document that um, the Duncan showed earlier, with, with the 30 countries, with, with the 30 countries which provide direct access to fiber optic cables, which make up the backbone of the internet. So yes, we, we can see that multiple countries around the world, uh, the intelligence agencies do collaborate, and it kind of looks like intelligence agencies around the world are collaborating and creating this global surveillance ecosystem in a way. So it's not really about competing. I, I think, like I said before, I think competing, competition has to do with, um, with, with interests and with, with your interest in the specific moment in time. Um, in the in a specific, for example, if we're talking about China and the U.S., then yes, there, there might be some competing interests, and I'm imagining that no, there's not that much collaboration as much as there is with other countries. So it really comes down to politics, some degree, I think, and a whole bunch of other factors. And yeah, so. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> with regard to that question about whether uh, um, you know good intent. Uh, Originally, it was good intent. I mean, the whole idea was in, in World War II, you had the UK and the US and Australians and most of the English-speaking world collaborating to break the uh, Enigma Code, the Purple Code in Japan, and so forth. And that was all well and good. And that was the whole idea of creating NSA, was to continue that, uh, that, um, that expertise and not lose it. The problem is, when uh, uh, we didn't have wars, we just had a Cold War. Uh, to turn that not on uh, the, the Nazis, the Germans, or whatever, uh, but to turn it on the American public. And that's the problem. When you set up an agency, as I mentioned, that's outside the law, um, that can happen. And that's, that's the problem. Yeah, there was good intention when Truman set it up. But uh, you put presidents like Nixon and uh, Bush and, to a large degree, Obama in there. And uh, we've got uh, the situation we have. <clears throat> With regard to what Sai said earlier about the uselessness, I mean, I completely agree. The, uh, the agency came out at one point saying, well, we had 56 times where we were able to save the world. <clears throat> it came down once they, uh, the uh, Congressional Intelligence Committee started analyzing it, down to one instance, and it was a taxi driver in San Diego who sent $8,000 to some group in Somalia. So that's what we've gotten out of that big... Uh, system of years and years collecting all of the metadata and everything. Um, on the, uh, just on India, one, one quick uh, uh, thing on that is that <clears throat> people don't realize it, but when you're calling up American Express, for example, to find out about your bill or you're calling Bank AmeriCard, you're not talking to somebody in New York. You're talking to somebody in India. Uh, now, the difference is uh, the NSA can target that organization in India, because it's a foreign organization running a foreign company. Um, what they're picking up, however, are all these Americans talking about bank accounts and so forth. So these are little loopholes you have to really look for. Uh, and the last thing on the privatization, um, yeah, that's the problem. You, you once had an agency that was all doing it itself. That was the NSA. And then after 9-11, they were just flooded with money. I mean, billions and billions and billions of dollars they didn't even know what to do with. So the only way they can do it, and since the physical planet NSA can only hold so many people, they began throwing that money all over the, uh, uh, the uh, private sector, and you have companies that nobody's ever heard of that are hiring people to do eavesdropping. The problem is none of those people have accountability. You can't send an FOI request to... Uh, to Booz Allen. Uh, you, you can't have these people appearing before Congress. They're just private individuals. But they're listening to our conversations. And as Snowden showed, uh, uh, the NSA does such a poor job of keeping this information. Uh, who knows if this information doesn't get out to other people? So um, uh, again, I'm the person holding, uh, standing between you and lunch. So uh, I think I'll end it there and let everybody go back to lunch, uh, go out to lunch. Thanks very much.